Good afternoon and welcome to Governance Dialogues, a program that we host on a periodic basis to explore governance challenges and priorities in conversations with thought leaders, be they regulators, board members, investors, or other financial market participants. And the, for those of you who have joined the program over the last few months, you would know that we've canvassed a wide range of topics uh, from governance of uh, technology companies uh, to um, um, the shareholder activism by institutional investors to country and company specific uh, trends. Um, and some of these conversations have actually taken place in, in, in dialogue with board members, which is uh, a very important uh, component of, our, of this program, because after all, who knows better uh, the real practical governance challenges and, and uh, obstacles than those who sit around round tables or square tables, or as it may be now, Zoom calls, uh, in discussing some of these um, uh, challenges, both from a strategy, governance, and operational point of view. Um, so, for example, a few months uh, back, we had uh, a conversation with um, uh, a prominent board member in Canada, David Beatty, who talked about the North American situation. And today's, in today's episode, I would like to um, turn uh, our geographic focus a little bit to Germany, where we've had uh, both a string of interesting news, positive news, but also some challenges um, from a company case perspective, looking at Volkswagen, Deutsche Bank, um, and, um, and a few others. And it is my pleasure to, um, to welcome today Daniela Weber-Ray to this program to talk about some of, the, um, some of these interesting cases that we've seen coming out of Germany, but also to consider some of the um, uh, experiences or um, lessons learned from on a European perspective, because he, she engages uh, quite uh, widely on, uh, on, uh, on a range of issues across Europe. So it is my pleasure to welcome you, uh, uh, Daniela, to this program today. You're joining us, I think, uh, directly from, from Germany. Hello, Alyssa. Good to see you again after a long time. Uh, the advantages of Zoom conferences that it is so easily done. Um, it was more difficult physically sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I think if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I saw you perhaps last time in person um, at the British uh, Academy's uh, Future Cooperation um, uh, Conference about two years ago, um, yeah. it was hosted by Colin Mayer, who uh, incidentally also uh, was one of the participants in our program today. Uh, if, sorry, a few, few weeks ago. <laughs> um, so it's, yeah. it's a pleasure to continue this, this uh, dialogue virtually for now. Happy. Um, we had a morning uh, a session this morning with the British Academy. I find it a very interesting project. I mean, for you, it must also be very interesting. Absolutely. And uh, we will get to some of the, um, some of the issues um, that the, the project is considering in, in, in this conversation. But just um, for the benefit of our audience, I'd like to say a few words to perhaps introduce you. Uh, of course, I've followed your work. I've been a big fan for, for many years. But um, for those of you who perhaps don't know Daniela, she has, uh, held, um, has um, worn multiple hats uh, over her uh, extensive career, um, being a partner at Clifford Chance, but also with direct governance expertise serving on, on boards of uh, large companies in Germany, but also in France, such as um, you know, BNP Paribas, where you were non-executive um, director, if I'm, memory serves me right. Um, and of course, you've had many other uh, governance-related uh, responsibilities, of course, um, not least uh, as the chief, uh, the chief uh, governance officer, if I'm not mistaken, was the title of uh, Deutsche Bank. So certainly, I think your experiences are very interesting to, um, to consider as a background to consider what is going on in, in Germany today. And with that, I thought to perhaps um, begin this, um, this conversation by asking you about your views on, on what's happening in, in Germany from a, from a governance perspective. So of course, we've heard over the last um, several months, a number of cases, Wirecard is something that we've discussed on this program, um, but also Volkswagen, Deutsche Bank, with, with which I know you're more than familiar with, and I wonder, from, from your perspective, you can say a few words as to whether you see these cases being part of a continuum uh, or sort of isolated cases where there's specific failings that are, you know, just happen to be in Germany, but not necessarily related in terms of their um, um, failings and, and lessons learned. Uh, well, the cases you refer to are really very different cases. Um, I think the problems in Germany were internationally 
um, perceived as of Siemens. Siemens, the Siemens case a couple of years ago was one of bribery and corruption. Um, the law in Germany had changed a couple of years earlier and they hadn't properly adapted. Uh, then uh, came uh, uh, Deutsche Bank, a lot of discussion about Deutsche Bank, but Deutsche Bank obviously is a financial institution and uh, the problems relate to violation of uh, regulatory requirements and many other issues which um, are really part of the banking world and the non-regulation of certain parts of the banking world. That is not at all a typical German issue. Um, Deutsche Bank really at the time war, uh, had three geographical centers, the US, uh, UK and Germany. And I think that it was rather the, um, yeah, the, 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 the issues between the German and the Anglo-Saxon culture that led to the, uh, to the problems. It was it, it not much happened in Germany. It was really more on the investment banking side, which was London-based and New York-based. Um, clear regulatory issues. The current uh, team under Christian Seving, whom, uh, for whom I have uh, an enormous respect, um, uh, really is, uh, um, I think they're doing really fine. Uh, I think they're do really, doing really fine on, uh, on dealing with those issues of the past. You refer to Wirecard. Wirecard is one may say financial sector, it's financial sector related in any event, but um, in my view, I mean, there are a number of failures. Um, clearly the regulators failed uh, in, in Europe and in Germany in regulating Europe-wide uh, this type of financial platforms, payment platforms. Um, there is a, a fragmentation of regulation and that is clearly being attacked now. Um, ESMA has been dealing with that. Um, the German regulator is dealing with that uh, clear failures of the system Europe-wide. Uh, there is a clear, um, as a consequence, uh, a clear um, insufficiency in, uh, in regulation, in, in supervision by BaFin. Um, there, are, there are two, uh, two heads, BaFin war, uh, market supervision and banking supervision, banking supervision is only a small part within Wirecard market supervision. Um, they, um, they started off a number of things, but they didn't really have the enforcement rights. That is a clear failure of the German regulatory system. So this is currently being uh, tackled uh, by the very first draft having been provided a couple of weeks ago, being heavily discussed, of course. Uh, it will take until, in my view, Easter of next year to have the law there which will provide, uh, as everybody expects, and as the current draft uh, says, very strong enforcement rights by BaFin, uh, way ahead of anything they had so far. And um, there was another regulatory uh, body in Germany, the DRP, which uh, had those enforcement rights, but, but the way they were supposed to cooperate didn't work well. So DRP didn't do their, their job. It's interesting you mentioned this regulatory fragmentation because it's something that we've also been commenting on and actually um, an op-ed I wrote in the, in the FT last week on the, on the Arab world talked about these mm -hmm. companies falling through the cracks. You know, for example, the case, yeah. uh, this is far away from Germany, but uh, for example, NMC, which is an Emirati company listed on the London Stock Exchange, Abraj, which was the private equity company that sort of had a, multiple subsidiaries, as you know, and that also kind of fell through the cracks. And this idea of, of things falling through the cracks or cases falling through the cracks, you also mentioned even within one jurisdiction between perhaps two regulators, and, and um, it's, it's interesting you mentioned this, um, this sort of review of responsibilities of, of Baffin. May I ask what, you th what your thoughts are as to what might be some of the key areas that they're sort of looking at right now? I know audits is one of them because supervision of auditors was, as, as far as I remember, previously not with Baffin, and that might be changing. And indeed, uh, many other regulators <laughs> that I've spoken to also talk about the fact that Regular or supervision of auditors is, a, is an issue for them. So I wonder what your thoughts are on this um, particular issue and other other issues that Buffin might want to, let's say, bring back in their 
The, 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 the true political issue is whether to strengthen or weaken Bafin, uh, because there are many who say that Bafin has a lot of fault in, in this entire game, which is not quite my personal view. Mm -hmm. um, I think the true fault here uh, is clearly also with the boards and the auditors in the first place. Um, but perhaps also a certain um, view in Germany that the UK, the Financial Times, should not tell us what is good and bad. That may have been also at play here, yeah? I'm not going to okay. judge on that. <laughs> but it's somewhat bizarre when you, there are so many hints that you don't react on it. Uh, that new law uh, will toughen standards for auditors, that is absolutely clear. It will not necessarily provide supervision by BaFin to the auditors, um, but it will toughen the standards, it will toughen the liability, will toughen the liability periods. Um, and uh, it's going, going to be a challenge. And obviously, um, the auditors are not extremely happy with that. So we'll see what will come of it. Yes. Um, but the fragmentation is the aspect that needs to be dealt with, absolutely needs to be dealt with, irrespective of, of the Wirecard case. Wirecard simply detected the problem. You said things fall between the cracks. I think there are companies who also play with those cracks. Of course. Uh, they actually, their business <laughs> model is built on that. Yes. What we see with Wirecard is an excessive amount of criminal energy from all we know so far, yeah. um, uh, and clearly uh, using the cracks in the system of our global financial markets and global payment systems, uh, yeah. we will certain it will certainly take years before we know. But let's turn to the other people who are in charge here. I happen to have looked into Wirecard prior to its explosion. Um, I, I looked at the KPMG report right after it came out because it was public. Mm. Um, and when I read this report, um, it was astounding, astounding how boards have failed here um, because they may have not detected the fraud. Perhaps that was well disguised, but they should have detected the total lack of cooperation of the entire uh, company uh, with the auditors. And you cannot, whether it's special auditors or the normal auditors or whatever auditor who is looking at your company, you cannot um, refuse cooperation. And that was done over many years. And, and that is where I really blame the boards. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find it quite funny that the boards are not widely discussed, at least not widely discussed in the German press. It's yeah, I, I do agree with you on that point as well. And, and um, it's kind of auditor collaboration in many of these other cases, even outside of Germany that we were working on, where I think that was a clear red flag that um, could have detected things. Banks also, uh, in many cases, in case of non-financial corporates where uh, funds were flowing in and out could have also been um, um, used in a much uh, wiser way if, if, if there was a will. Um, but just to change a little bit for our, our conversation from perhaps the, the negative news to, to some of the positive news, there are uh, a few uh, interesting developments that have also transpired in Germany. I mean, I noticed um, uh, in a number of companies, there's also, I mean, this is not a German specifically trend, but a reflection of global trends perhaps on, on Germany. Uh, on this whole ESG sort of bandwagon, uh, the sustainability focus um, that COVID has uh, perhaps reinforced. Um, companies like uh, Deutsche Bank, which we spoke just a second ago, have, have revised their, their governance structures. I know that recently they introduced a, even a sustainability committee of the board, which is a 13 sort of men or women, men and women strong committee, um, which is you know, larger than boards and some companies altogether. And so there are changes also in the positive direction. Do you mind to, to say a few words about what you see are kind of the, the currents that, uh, that, um, that uh, are you know, positive evolutions in, in, in Germany, in large company boards? I think there, there, there are two things uh, impacting Germany right now, uh, or perhaps even three. We completely redid the German corporate governance code. We, not, we didn't rewrite it, we restructured it com completely. While I was still there, I was there until the publication of the completely restructured code. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but then I left after 12 years. Um, and um, the focus there was on independence, which is a big issue also on the board governance uh, mm-hmm. topic, uh, also for the, for the auditors, and is being discussed in the Wirecard case also. There was a big issue on remuneration uh, um, so it's pay for performance, um, focus on also uh, non-financial aspects uh, having to be taken into account um, in the remuneration definition system. Um, so that was being redone. At the same time, we are seeing this debate about ESG on the one side and purpose on the other side. Yes. Um, they are related, but ESG is rather technical, uh, is being closely followed in the financial world. Really, the regulators are serving themselves of the banks to push for sustainability. They provide so many rules and regulations for banks in this area that they uh, indirectly force companies to change for more sustainable standards. Um, and when we, when we restructured that code, uh, another aspect, which was a smaller aspect at the time, but became, becomes very relevant now, uh, was introduced. Uh, since I was part of the British Academy debate and the purpose issue, I suggested, and, and I was also involved with the raison d'etre discussion in France, I suggested in a meeting that we should also introduce a similar concept in the code while we were restructuring it. So we introduced the concept of societal responsibility, which is really very similar to raison d'etre and purpose Mm -hmm. in, in its goal, in its direction. We introduced it because it's a vague term and very difficult to follow up on legally. We introduced it in, in the preamble but we also linked it to remuneration in our annotations uh, to the um, recommendations of the code. And this may well be one of the drivers of Deutsche Bank now taking care of that uh, specific sustainability uh, issue by creating a committee on top of the council, which already exists. So this new thing is part of the board. So it's the executive board. Um, while they always had a sustainability, um, Nachhaltigkeit, uh, sustainability uh, committee on the supervisory board, and they also have this sustainability council. So they have many, many wow. sustainable aspects. Now, the new one is really concentrating on the remuner- remuneration aspect, which is new. Just a focus on remuneration, how can we drive sustainability of Deutsche Bank um, from a commercial point of view, also from a reputational point of view, because it is very important for this bank in particular to be at uh, at the top of of the league when it comes to being clean and modern and, uh, and all of those aspects. And sustainability is the name of the game right now. So they create that to really enforce um, sustainable standards for remuneration. That's interesting. And in fact, you know, I I mean, some of these developments are sort of so new that uh, I wasn't even aware of some of the evolutions in in particular, the one that you mentioned in the code uh, on societal responsibility and raison d'etre, because there has been, of course, um, and and you know it perfectly well, a lot of discussion in France and with the Danone example being, you know, waved as as a flag everywhere. And I wonder, you know, apart from this Deutsche Bank example, do you think that that other companies in Germany are are sort of going in that direction, short term, long term, and in particular the link to remuneration, which is very interesting that you made, because as far as I know, it's not really made in the in the French uh, legal um, system. Um, yes. is, is that playing out already in practice, or do you think that it's a sort of a longer term evolution, let's say two, three years? From now, well, let's compare France and Germany because I sit on both on on boards on both sides. Um, the raison d'être is not um, in the wording of the code uh, linked to remuneration, but as it plays out with companies, they do link it. Um, there is a wide debate in France now as to how to implement uh, raison d'être. Um, and what degree to choose, because there are several steps you can, you can choose. You either simply use a raison d'etre 
or you make it part of your statutes, or you even become a benefit uh, corporation type of thing. Yes. Um, so this is a wide debate among sports, uh, numerous sports in France. Um, and obviously remuneration uh, does um, play a role there. You also need to see a, a renewed debate on remuneration um, and you see it in the current press with re uh, relation to ThyssenKrupp, that when, um, when the numbers aren't playing out because of, uh, because of an economic crisis, which is none of your fault, um, of course, uh, the boards are seeking to find uh, methods of remuneration which are sort of fairer to the executives uh, where they can really make a difference. And those aspects of sustainability and other um, purpose-related um, aspects um, and ESG as a whole, uh, of course, uh, become of relevance. Environmental aspects have been of relevance for quite a while. And there has been a strong push due to the new green uh, agenda and green uh, What's the new name? Uh, green green recovery. <laughs> yes. Um, the governance aspects are also constantly discussed. I think we will see way more of that. But the S aspect, the social aspect, has not been discussed so far. I agree with you. And that comes into play now with the health crisis. So that gives you a further angle and push to more in the thinking of purpose and raison d'être to go beyond the technical ESG and look at the societal role of the company, which is really the license to off operate. I mean, yeah. the license to operate is a term we used 10 years ago already, or after the financial markets crisis. And it, it is nothing else than the raison d'etre. Yeah? When society, we as taxpayers grant a license to a company and it does harm to our society, we must have the possibility to take it back. And all of that is part of the game now. Yes, absolutely. I think that um, I agree with you on the ESG uh, conversation and it's, we've published a number of thought pieces actually uh, way back at the first lockdown, uh, uh, speaking of, of, of the S and the fact that the S has not really been uh, well integrated, in particular, you know, when, when companies are, especially in the, in the US, where the, the labor protection system is, is much weaker than here in Europe, um, where companies are basically letting off their employees after you know, a very short period of time without really looking at executive compensation and where other short you know, cuts can be made. But um, on this issue of S, I mean, one of the, 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 the topics, and I guess this is also part of this good news bandwagon that I'd like to speak to you today of good news on the governance side coming out of Germany is the recent uh, decree that was passed to, um, to introduce a quota of, of women on boards. And it's presented in international, or let's say Anglo-Saxon press as something new. I know it's not something new, um, and you could surely share more on that because in Germany, that debate is, well, at least on paper actively, has been going on for, well, at least five years since the last uh, decree that was introduced uh, in 2016 when they mandated um, women on uh, quotas of women of boards and supervisory boards. But in management boards, the figures seem to be still um, quite low. I think the, the last one I saw was around 13% uh, of women on, manage on boards, management boards of German companies. So I wonder what your thoughts are as to how game-changing cha game this uh, new decree is and what are some of the repercussions that we might see in the sort of short and medium term? Well, I've been around in boards now since uh, 12 years. Um, <laughs> Uh, when I entered the German Corporate Governance Commission as the first woman, and for many years the only woman, we introduced the term diversity in the year 2009 in the code. Uh -huh. You cannot imagine how many of my co-members of that commission laughed about it and thought it's ridiculous, but uh, there was a lot of pressure by the chairman Klaus-Peter Müller, and there was me, I mean, the Ministry of Justice had pushed for me to enter. Um, so they couldn't avoid the debate. And we uh, were pretty convinced that if we were putting out a um, 
recommendation to take care of diversity without any strict quota. I was against quota at the time. Yes, I was too. <laughs> um, it is, uh, we thought that things would slowly change, but the companies simply ignored it. Then came uh, a push to, for laws, which obliged us as the code commission also to implement stricter requirements, which we did. We said, uh, we talked about uh, diversity at the, at the executive board, diversity at the supervisory board. Um, and, and only when that quota law for supervisory boards came, Mm. Only then did things change in Germany. They changed for supervisory boards, but only at those companies, for those companies, listed uh, companies, in essence, um, that fell under the realm of that law. Um, it didn't really permit society. Yeah. Um, so, um, well, we saw a, a small increase amongst the executives, but then again, a decrease last year. Um, so when there's crisis, we typically see more women exiting top positions than men. Um, that may have been one of the drivers for that quota initiative. I know many of the women who have driven it, um, they are, most of them are younger than I am. They ho hope and I hope that it's going to bring a lot of change. But I've seen so many two steps for yeah, in one direction, one step back approaches or even the reverse um, in Germany. We, we really have more of a cultural issue in Germany. If you compare to France, our neighboring country, there's simply no reason why it should be different here than in France. And in France, which is oh. a very, <clears throat> yeah, um, different society, different relations between men and women. One, one may even say that women play more of a female and um, sexualized role than in German society, but women are so much better off uh, in business uh, in France than in Germany. Really, I mean, I am all the time stunned by that, stunned simply. And, and actually, it's interesting you mentioned this this um, dance of a uh, few steps forward, few steps back, because it's yeah. not really only um, a German story. I remember, I think it was about two years ago, I was speaking at uh, the, the Turkish um, annual conference for, you know, director, women director for a conference with uh, uh, Mel Sararal. And uh, they also mentioned that even some of the more, let's say, well-intentioned measures, you know, for example, when the regulator increased uh, independence requirements for boards, what happened is, in fact, more men got nominated for those positions. So uh, it is, in a way, um, you know, a dance. And, and for some, in some countries, as you say, in Germany, perhaps more complicated than in France, that this dance has been kind of um, not, not consistently uh, moving forward. But one other aspect that I would like to come to uh, before our, our time is up today is, is um, a particular feature of this law, which is addressed specifically to government co government held companies, which where they, they ask that 30% of a board seats must be set specifically for women. And that is perhaps um, a, a quite an unusual approach. There are a few countries and, you know, in both emerging and developed markets, as you know, that have taken that uh, position and looking at specifically government government held companies, but it's in a way um, I would say an outlier, don't you think? I mean, and is, is there a specific sort of reason or, or thinking, do you think that drove that um, uh, requirement in the German context? Well, it has been discussed for many, many years, if not, if not decades. Um, first of all, let me share with you that there is now a public corporate governance code, which mm. was enacted this year. Yes. It sort of builds on the, the long existing German corporate governance code, but has some different features to it. Then there was a debate since very long about political parties having to uh, provide more or less a quota type approach. Uh, and then, of course, how serious is a government, a governance, a government pushing for change with companies if at their own companies they completely disregard um, equal treatment of women. Hmm. So um, this was clearly a driver. Um, and the two women uh, in charge in, in, in Germany, um, 
I mean, they, they clearly saw that and have been driving that change with the assistance of those very well-known women of, of the public scene, let's say, uh, company representatives or of the media. Um, and it all together assisted to push for that change, but there's a lot of resistance of it. Yeah, there's no draft yet. All we know is that as of three members on the board, there should be one woman, um, but we have no idea. I mean, simply no idea when uh, and how the draft will really look like. Yeah? Um, I think the current environment is such that they cannot really go back from it. Uh, in particular, also since uh, Markus Söder, you may have read that, uh, the, the minister of uh, the president, I mean, president of the state of Bavaria um, also said that he wants it. And he is really part of the conservative world. So that was helpful, <clears throat> but we don't know how it's going to end up. We really don't know. I, I hope it's gonna be good and a big step forward. And we will all, all the women uh, in business, we push for it to sort of hold the ground Mm. Um, but we don't know where we are going to end up. That, that's um, no, it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting sort of provision, which is why I thought to to, to talk about it. But I think um, more generally, developments with state-owned enterprises is something that uh, we are looking at quite a bit because naturally there has been so much state investment. You know, not only Germany with you know yeah. capital injections in Lufthansa and other companies, but also all over the world, and naturally. I think there are two trends that we may look at. You know, first, of course, the domestic investment to prop up um, equity or swaps or what's not to prop up companies. But also, uh, and let's face it, we have also a, 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 an important uh, investment from abroad, from um, you know, oil-rich countries, sovereign wealth funds, into into some European companies. So it will be, I think, a very interesting um, ownership uh, landscape to look at in terms of you know when we have uh, you know the Qatari sovereign wealth fund at the same table as the as the German government and as the same table as private investors and how those views will be reconciled. I think that will be, I don't know what, you, what your thoughts are on that, but I think it would be an interesting space to watch, no? Well, I don't think that uh, having more women on one side or the other really makes any difference as no. regards uh, discussions no. on the boards or as regards the role of institutional investors in Germany. Um, uh, clearly, it is within the power of the institutional investors to push for more change, and they are pushing for change. Um, also, as regards some of those aspects as sustainability and diversity. Um, and that is a good thing. Um, they also are the ones who may push for more change as regards remuneration and uh, taking care of sustainability aspects uh, in uh, remuneration. So I'm, I'm, I know that in France and Germany, many companies are very afraid of the institutional investors. And I, I completely see that they have not been, that they have also been harmful with uh, some comp companies because they didn't properly take account of the culture of the company and, and the players, the stakeholders. Um, but I don't think it's going to, I mean, the female issue will not, will not really make any difference in that respect. Of course, no, I was I was talking about sort of general state investment trends and, and um, <clears throat> what might be the impact. But I really would like to thank you in the interest of time. I, I have the promise to keep these dialogues to, to about half an hour each uh, in order to give viewers kind of a, a taste of what's what's happening on, on specific topics or in specific jurisdictions. And I think it was fascinating, even for also for me, uh, to talk with you today on, 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 on these various developments. So I would like to thank you for your time. Thanks a lot and have a great time uh, wherever you are in the world. Bye. Thank you, Daniela. And for our viewers, um, thank you for staying with us for um, this episode of Governance Dialogues. We encourage you to um, subscribe, subscribe to the channel and of course uh, share and comment um, on the content that we post on our YouTube channel and other social media, um, including uh, our website, uh, governance, government.center. Thank you. Mm -hmm.